This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 17. Welcome to the 17th episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from FertilityFriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Please stop by the blog and leave a comment if you enjoy today's show. I love hearing from you. You'll find the show notes for today's episode and all the podcast episodes at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast. And you can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. So please tweet me also if you enjoy today's show. And in today's episode, I'm very excited to be talking with Dr. Shauna Daru. Dr. Daru is a naturopathic doctor who specializes in women's health care and fertility. She has been treating women in her Toronto clinic since 2004. She is a member of the Ontario Association of Naturopathic Doctors, the Canadian Naturopathic Association, and the Institute of Naturopathic Education and Research. (laughs) Naturopathic medicine is her second career, actually, and her first career being engineering chemistry from Queen's University. And today we'll be talking about the role that naturopathic medicine can play in improving women's health and fertility, And we'll be talking about common fertility challenges, including uterine fibroids, endometriosis, and much more. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Duru. Great. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much for coming on the show. So I did give you a bit of an introduction, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background, especially what brought about the career change (laughs) from engineering chemistry to naturopathic medicine. Um. Yeah, it was a bit of a long story. So I started off in engineering because um, it made sense at the time. Um, I have a you know strong background in you know in math and science, and um, I think as a young woman going to university, it was uh, it was an easy choice because they were offering women large scholarships to go into engineering programs back then. So I made my choice based on what I was good at, not based on who I was. Um, I finished the program in engineering, but didn't love it at all. And uh, through that time, I started, um, you know, meeting people who did yoga, who meditated, who shopped at health food stores, and it opened my eyes to a world that I didn't really know at all. So from there, I, um, you know, I worked very briefly as an engineer um, in the oil industry, and then, um, you know, dropped it all, moved out to Vancouver and volunteered at um, three different naturopathic clinics out there. So that's where I started to learn, um, to learn more about this field. So um, it's definitely been a passion for, uh, for many years now, and um, I feel quite grateful that I got into it a little bit older because I think when you, uh, when you really know who you are and what your, what your interests are, it makes it an easier career, career path. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. And then somewhere along there, you, it seems like you kind of specialized in the area of women's health care and fertility in particular. Was there something that kind of drew you to, to that area? Um, I think at the end of my naturopathic program, the the women's health side started to appeal to me more. Um, You know, probably this engineering brain that I have really likes the hormonal system. It's probably (laughs) one of the most complex in the body. And um, I love how everything interconnects. So we can't talk about hormones without, you know, how they affect, you know, mood and energy and digestive system and, you know, neurological system and everything else. I love how things interconnect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's... It's such an obviously I'm interested in the same area. So it's, there's just so much to learn and so much, so many different ways you can help, um, yes. especially in your profession. And so from, for the listeners who aren't familiar with naturopathic medicine, maybe you could take a moment to talk about what naturopathic doctors do and how it's different from traditional doctors or traditional allopathic medicine. Okay. Actually, I'm going to start with how they're the same first. Um, so. Okay. In terms of our training, we, you know, we have a, a four-year post, uh, you know, post-secondary program. So after an undergrad, and a lot of the training in terms of the basics is the same in terms of, you know, anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, pathology, so how to diagnose. Um, but where it where it becomes different is that, um, you know, in two ways. One is that we're learning ways of treating conditions naturally, so using herbs and vitamins and supplements and um, you know, stress reduction and lifestyle changes. And the other way that it's different is that as a naturopath, we are looking for underlying causes of illnesses and conditions rather than just treating symptoms. And that's a huge one when it comes to fertility. 
Um, so that's uh, that's something that um, that I do a lot of work with is trying to find why people aren't getting pregnant. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and it must be so refreshing for your clients. I think that one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show and one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is just to kind of share with women the different options that they have. Uh, when you go to a, a traditional doctor, often there's certain options that you wouldn't be made aware of. Whereas if someone finds themselves in your office, <laughs> there just becomes, you know, a different way of looking at everything, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and sometimes it isn't, you know, one or the other. I, I work very often with people who are, who are going through, you know, conventional fertility treatments as well. Um, there's ways that we can support that complementary. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it isn't always one or the other. I'm not, I'm not anti-medicine at all. And that's sometimes where people get confused, um, especially MDs actually, as they think we're, we're, you know, not supportive of what they do. Um, I just like to look at, is there a less invasive way of doing it? Is there a natural way of getting to the underlying causes? And, um, you know, are my patients being supported well enough? Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely one of the questions I wanted to ask you, a bit, perhaps a bit later in the interview, but the different ways that you do support women when they are going through traditional medical fertility treatments. Sure. But maybe we could start. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was kind of what are the most common fertility related concerns that bring women to see you? Certain things that you see, I guess, more frequently. Um, the one that I see most frequently um, is uh, women who are older. <laughs> and um, it, it's tricky. So if I have a patient who is, you know, over 38 years old, um, it, we don't know if it's age and egg quality or if there's something else underlying it. And I find that that's where, um, where conventional fertility treatments will almost write it off as, you know, age and egg quality related but I'm very careful to make sure that we're covering all the other bases as well. Um, so that's probably the, the most common. Um, the next most common, I would say, um, well, I guess it would tie. So two other big ones would be, um, would be endometriosis. Um, and sometimes it's not yet diagnosed um, when people come to my office because the only way to accurately diagnose endometriosis is with, um, is with laparoscopy, so with surgery. Mm. So often we're, you know, we're going based on symptoms or family history. Um, and then the next one would be the effect of stress on fertility. And that one's something that is somewhat controversial in, uh, in, in different, you know, with different opinions, because some women do seem to be able to conceive no matter what's going on in their life. Um, but the effect of stress on all of the other hormonal systems can be significant. And um, the way I speak about stress with my patients is that it amplifies whatever's not working. So mm -hmm. if there's, you know, some mild imbalance in terms of the hormones or in terms of the thyroid um, or in terms of, um, you know, in terms of ovulation, then it will get much bigger if stress is there. Okay. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is, well, the, the most common fertility challenge that you see is women who are kind of at a, I guess, an advanced maternal age. Uh, you mentioned kind of 38 and, and on. Yes. And you mentioned kind of looking for the difference, where, uh, whether it's age-related or egg quality-related versus another issue. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, I guess, what that means. Um, what's the difference there if a woman has an age-related concern versus if it's an actual underlying issue? Well, often we can't tell until we do some testing. Um, and the age-related age concern um, may or may not show up on basic blood work. So we might get the obvious signs like a, you know, a high day three FSH or a low ovarian reserve, so a marker called the AMH. Um, but sometimes there's nothing other than her age that's, that's going on unless she's gone through fertility treatments that haven't worked. So um, I... I do support the egg quality in all of those cases, but I also keep digging to see if there's something else going on. So making sure that we check the thyroid thoroughly, making sure we check, um, you know, progesterone levels, um, you know, doing a really thorough history in terms of her overall health and her menstrual history as well. Um, because uh, I, I don't like to always chalk it up to age because, I mean, everybody knows somebody who's have a, had a baby at 42 with no trouble. This so is true. it's not always age. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you always hear the story of the accident <laughs> Yes, at yeah. the age of 42. Yeah. Um, and so 
from what you're saying, it sounds like when it is age related, there are still things that you can do to support egg quality and, and kind of promote fertility to some extent. Yes, um, to a degree. So yes, there are, you know, antioxidant supplements, things like coenzyme Q10 and a couple of others that um, somewhat turn back time in terms of the egg quality. So they support the mitochondrial function of the eggs, which is the energy centers of them. And that's the part that seems to age as our, our eggs get older. So being on high dose of things that support mitochondria helps um, tremendously. The other part is looking at stress hormones because the more depleted um, a woman's stress hormones or adrenal system is, the more rapidly her overall hormonal system is aging as well. So um, making sure that we're supporting the stress. Um, and another piece around that is that progesterone levels simply start to decline after the age of 35. So um, often a really simple thing to do is to check progesterone and make sure that we're supporting that either with herbs or with actual progesterone if it's very low because sometimes that one simple thing makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Well, on the on the podcast, uh, because it's fertility awareness related, you know, we've we talk a lot about the different stages of the menstrual cycle. And obviously, progesterone is so important in the in the luteal phase or the post ovulatory phase. Right. In that if the luteal phase isn't long enough, then you could technically be conceiving every month, but the egg, it just doesn't have enough time to implant before the endometrial lining starts to fall. So right. there's so many different factors in this kind of quest for fertility that we need to be aware of. Of course, yes. And one of the other, I guess, second most common scenarios that you see is endometriosis. And that was one of the topics I was hoping to chat with you about today. Maybe mm. we could talk a little bit about it. Uh, so, you know, for the listeners who maybe have heard about it, we've all kind of heard the term, but maybe you could talk a little bit about what endometriosis is. Sure. So um, endometriosis means that there is um, endometrial tissue, meaning um, uterine lining cells that have grown outside of the, the uterine cavity. So they could be on the outside of the uterus, they could be around the ovaries, um, they could be, you know, inside the pelvic wall and occasionally, you know, quite far away from there as well. So what that means is that um, when a woman menstruates, there is uh, there's inflammation and activity of those cells every time that she has a period. In terms of, of fertility, what that means is that there is a high amount of inflammation inside the uterus that can affect the ability of an embryo to implant. Endometriosis can also affect things structurally, meaning and you know an egg may simply not be able to reach the the uterine cavity in terms of after ovulation mm -hmm. um, and as a naturopath i would consider endometriosis as an as an autoimmune condition so what i find i get the most the most results with is calming down inflammation and balancing the immune system there there are cases that there is so much endometrial growth in the pelvic cavity that sur surgery may be necessary before a woman can conceive, but there are a lot of things to try first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and what are some of the common symptoms, I guess, that a woman may be experiencing? Because I know that you mentioned that it's not always diagnosed because the only way that it can be diagnosed, you said, is through surgery, essentially. Right. So what are some of the, I guess, common symptoms women experience? Well, the most common symptom is pain, so bad period cramps. So if I have a patient who has, um, you know, required a significant amount of anti-inflammatory medication with her period, especially if it's been since puberty, that's a big red flag that there's likely endometriosis. Having cramping pain that starts the week before the period is often a marker as well. So, you know, having, you know, mild to moderate cramps on day one or two is not necessarily a sign, but having cramps that build up and, and really peak strongly on day one. Sometimes there's also a heavier period or painful ovulation or painful intercourse. Another marker is having loose bowel movements at the start of the period. That happens for most women to some degree, but, you know, urgent, painful diarrhea is often another marker of endometriosis. And there are some cases that are quite silent, meaning there aren't a lot of symptoms. Sometimes there's barely any period pain um, because of the location of where the extra endometrial tissue is. So often in a, a case of unexplained infertility when everything else has been ruled out, that is the likely diagnosis. Hmm. 
And you wouldn't really think, especially, um, it's good to know that not all women have the, the, you know, the, obviously not all women have the same symptoms, but when you hear about endometriosis, you often hear it coupled with significant kind of menstrual challenges and pain and, you know, bleeding and all that type of, all those types of things. And so I think it's really good to know that it, it's not all, it doesn't always present that way. Because no, in those I'll, cases, it, I'm guessing it would be missed definitely more frequently. Yes, yes. And that's where we talk through family history as well. So, you know, if a, a mother or a sister has been diagnosed with endometriosis and I have a woman with unexplained infertility in front of me, I'm still going to be questioning it, even if she doesn't have a lot of symptoms. Mm-hmm. Well, and you mentioned that there's an autoimmune component to endometriosis, and that's something I've kind of recently read. I I don't personally know a lot about that aspect of it. Maybe you could talk a little bit about about that, because in autoimmune conditions, your immune system is attacking a certain part of your body. Yes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that kind of plays out in endometriosis. Sure. So I would consider it where the immune system is being is overactive and dysregulated in its recognition of what is safe and what is a threat. So um, with endometriosis, there's tissue where it doesn't belong. So the immune system hasn't been effective in terms of um, in terms of preventing that from happening and also gets overreactive when um, when there's inflammation from that tissue basically menstruating in an area that the blood can't escape from. So um, Estrogen alone also increases um, the inflammatory action and uh, in, in the uterus as well. So it, it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle where we have estrogen feeding the inflammation and then the inflammation perpetuating the endometriosis as well. Hmm. Well, and one of the ways that doctors tend to, or maybe it's the only way <laughs> that doctors tend to, to treat this condition is by prescribing the birth control pill. Um, right. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I know that it's obviously helpful for temporary relief of of extremely terrible, painful symptoms. And a lot of women obviously are very grateful for having that option to kind of get rid of the pain associated with the condition. But maybe you could talk a little bit about what some of your recommendations would be and maybe why, why you would agree with the pill or why you wouldn't agree with the pill as a treatment for the for this condition sure well as a naturopath the pill is not not often my first choice that being said i do have patients whose endometriosis is so severe that we haven't been able to resolve their symptoms or their pain without surgery so it, sometimes it is the you know the best choice but my my preference is always to do what we can naturally what i see the most success with is um, is an anti-inflammatory diet and it's quite remarkable if you can lower inflammation in the body as a whole, how the menstrual pain will improve as well. One thing that's been studied in terms of you know how to lower inflammation through food is simply going on a gluten-free diet. Mm-hmm. So you know one study of uh, you know two hundred over two hundred women with severe endometriosis-related symptoms found that after one year, seventy-five percent of them had improvement in pain. That's huge. Yeah. And that's just one change, nothing else. It's just going gluten free. So that's one thing that I always recommend. And otherwise, um, definitely lowering inflammation through other means as well. In terms of what type of an anti inflammatory diet works, it varies from person to person. I've had numerous women who've done extremely well with a vegan diet. So they find that animal proteins tend to really fire up their inflammation. And I've had other patients who've done extremely well with an autoimmune paleo type of diet. So they're avoiding grains and legumes and sugar and dairy. It varies from person to person. So sometimes it is a little bit of trial and error to find out what approach is going to work best. I often start with a food intolerance test to diet, you know, to identify what a woman's, you know, primary inflammatory foods are, put her on gluten free, and, um, you know, and go from there. With with the right nutrition plan, we can often even minimize the number of nutritional supplements that are needed as well. I find that diet's more powerful than anything else. Hmm. That's something we've talked a lot about on the show as well, just the power, the sheer power of food. But of course, mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, you need to balance it with nutritional supplements, depending on the situation. One of the questions I wanted to ask you as well is, 
with a condition like endometriosis, I mean, the way that you've described it and just the, you know, the stories that I've heard from women who've suffered from it, it's obviously very severe, or at least it can be. So when a woman is kind of embarking on a natural type approach, what kind of time frame? So if someone was listening and they have endometriosis, they've been suffering from it. Now they've found you and, you know, they know that they, there's hope. What would, I guess, she expect in terms of, because this isn't going to be an overnight, you kind of take out gluten today and then tomorrow you're going to feel better. No, not at all. I mean, just like that study I quoted was, um, you know, that was over 12 months. Mm -hmm. I don't find that it takes that long to get some improvements. Um, Most people notice some improvement within two cycles. Um, and, and, And then we go from there and it gradually gets better. Again, as I said before, sometimes it's trial and error with the diet as well. So mm-hmm. we'll start with, you know, identifying food intolerances and going gluten-free. And then we'll play around with which protein types are best. Um, and we'll add some anti-inflammatory supplements. A couple that I find most effective would be fish oil supplements, pygnogenol, so pine bark extract, and, um, and turmeric. And most women are finding, you know, significant improvements by three months. And it does continue to improve from there over the first year. Okay. And one of the questions that I thought of as well is because I know, for example, like I didn't suffer from endometriosis, but personally I've suffered from, you know, extremely painful periods. And so if you have a a client who's coming to you and they're on the pill because of their painful endometriosis symptoms, do you suggest that they kind of start these dietary changes while they're still on the pill and kind of gradually come off of it? Or do you kind of... Or I guess I'm sure it varies case by case, but I guess generally speaking, is is a dietary change is something that you would kind of let them start and then kind of go off the pill in a few months? Or would you kind of encourage them to kind of go off the pill at the same time as these changes? Uh, no, I would definitely do the diet changes first um, and do as much as we can to lower inflammation because it's going to make a huge difference in terms of how the symptoms rebound coming off the pill. I'd also take a really close look at which pill they're on, and if they're on a higher dose pill, switch them to a lower dose one before we went before we go off altogether. I find that the the rebound effect coming off a pill can be so um, can be pretty severe, so it's really important to um, to do this really cautiously. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I mean. having had it kind of, I guess, you know, everyone thinks that theirs is the worst, right? So, but if a person's suffering from severe endometriosis, my heart goes out to them. I mean, that's, menstrual pain is terrible. And so that was definitely a question I had, because then it kind of also gives a little bit of a cushion, because um, a lot of women are afraid to stop taking the pill because of the real pain that they're going to experience uh, every time they have a menstrual period. Yeah, no, I would I would work with somebody for a minimum of three months before even considering going off the pill. And I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of things to look at with the diet and the lifestyle first. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and at the beginning when we started talking about endometriosis, you did mention some of the different ways that endometriosis can impair fertility due to the inflammation, the egg not really having anywhere to implant or potentially not even being able to get through the fallopian tubes and into the uterus at all Mm -hmm. and so when you have clients that are experiencing endometriosis you know after they implement the dietary changes and after they allow for their menstrual cycle to heal I guess you could say do you find that fertility kind of returns Um, have you had success in those areas Yeah, I have had success, but obviously not 100%. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say it's about 50%, and that varies depending on where the endometriosis is and how severe it is. So usually when I'm working with people, I don't have a, you know, a diagnosis yet. They haven't had surgery. Nobody's looked inside. So we're doing as much as we can over a three to six month period to lower inflammation, um, support hormone balance, make sure everything's lined up right. And in a lot of cases, it will work. Um, in some cases, those women still do need to have surgery before they can get pregnant. But they're in much better state to have that surgery. And the other thing is when after the surgery, they're in a lot they're a lot less likely to have it come back again. Mm. That's the biggest issue with having um, laparoscopy for endometriosis where they go inside and they remove the endo- the excess endometrial tissue. 
is that it always comes back unless you do something different. So in my patients who we've worked leading up to surgery and then supported them afterwards, they have much less recurrence. Hmm. Yeah, that's that. I don't know. That just that's such a great hope because this condition is is so severe and it impairs fertility. And I think it's really important for women to hear that there's you know ways to really address it and really it it kind of gives you the best chance, I guess you could say, in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we could switch gears a little bit. One of the one of the topics I wanted to chat with you about this evening as well was uh, uterine fibroids. Okay. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what they are and maybe why they form. Okay. So fibroids are muscular tumors that grow inside the wall of the uterus. So they're benign, so they're not cancerous tumors. They can be very tiny, like a, you know, less than a centimeter, or they can be really large, like the size of a grapefruit. The actual cause is not very well known with these. There are there are strong genetic links. So if somebody's mother has had fibroids, she has a very high likelihood of developing them as well. And having uh, high estrogen levels can certainly stimulate fibroid growth, although that's debatable as to whether it actually causes them because a lot of women have high estrogen and no fibroids. It is a condition that for most women tends to get worse or develop through their 40s when their estrogen is less balanced with their progesterone levels. And that makes sense as to why the the fibroids would be growing. Um, So if there's more estrogen and less progesterone to counterbalance, the um, the cellular growth would be fed more rapidly. And they typically go away or they shrink after menopause when the hormone levels drop. Hmm. And what an impact can fibroids have on fertility? That varies. In some cases, no impact at all. It depends where they're located and how big they are. So there are three types of fibroids. There are ones that grow inside the uterine cavity. Those are called submucosal. And there are some that grow within the wall of the uterus, and those are called intramural. And then there's ones that grow on the outside of the uterus, and they're called subserosal. The ones that grow inside the uterine cavity are the most concerning for fertility because they can, number one, take up some space inside the uterus, and they can also have a big impact on where an embryo can implant in the, in the endometrial lining. The ones inside the wall and on the outside, as long as they're not very large, don't often have a huge impact on fertility. They're more of a concern with, um, with labor and delivery because, uh, you know, women with large fibroids almost always will require a C-section. And partly that's just to reduce the risk of hemorrhage because that, that does become higher if the fibroid is large because the uterine lining, the uterus can't, you know, clamp down and stop bleeding after giving birth. Hmm. No, that's, that's good to know. That's something I've never heard before. So what are some of the symptoms uh, if a woman has uterine fibroids? You know, if, if, for example, if someone didn't know they had fibroids, what are some of the symptoms associated with it? The most common one is really heavy bleeding. And that's, you know, usually when I will send someone for an ultrasound to check for fibroids if their periods are very heavy. Occasionally, though, fibroids don't cause heavy bleeding. And again, that depends where they're located and how much they're affecting the uterus. But I have had a few patients with, you know, significantly sized sized fibroids, like seven centimeters or more, and no heavy period. But that's the most common symptom. There's often, you know, some bloating in the lower abdomen area, so some fullness there. Sometimes you can see them. So if somebody is, uh, you know, is quite thin and their fibroids are at the front of their abdomen, you can actually, you know, see a bulge there. Frequent urination would be another common symptom because the uterus is just simply enlarged with the fibroids and it's pressing on the bladder. And occasionally there would be, you know, some low back pain or pain with sex or, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes they can affect the digestive system as well as if they're large. Mm-hmm. Well, and from my understanding, you know, in some women, they get worse as they age, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. and it can be, or it is one of the most common reasons why women end up having hysterectomies. What are, what are some of the ways that fibroids can actually be treated through naturopathic medicine? Um, To be honest with naturopathic medicine, there's not a lot that will shrink them, Mm -hmm. um, the best we can usually do is to stall their growth. 
And stalling their growth means addressing the hormone imbalance that's feeding them and keeping them growing. So that again comes back to addressing estrogen dominance. So often in women with fibroids, they have higher than the average num amounts of estrogen and they're not detoxing it very well. So they're not processing and eliminating it. And in some cases, they'll also have low progesterone as well. So supporting how they're metabolizing their estrogens is a, is a really big one. Yeah, so occasionally we'll get a little bit of shrinkage with fibroids, but not dramatically. If they're actively growing and they're not already calcifies, we, we can get a little bit of change. Acupuncture is another thing that I've seen some success with as well. So acupuncture and Chinese herbs will sometimes help in terms of shrinking them slightly and, um, at, at, and also reducing the, the speed that they're growing. One thing to mention is that fibroids, when they occur in a younger woman, like somebody who's in their 20s or early 30s, tend to be a lot more stubborn to treat hmm. than ones that are fairly, you know, I would say fairly typical growing in the late 30s or 40s. Um, those ones tend to respond to natural treatments better because they're very clearly hormonally, you know, hormonally fed. Um, the ones that start early are a lot more confusing in terms of how to address them. Hmm. So it sounds like there's some, I guess, hope in terms of st stopping them from getting worse yes. and kind of stabilizing them. But, you know, in terms of shrinking them, you know, maybe trying a combination of acupuncture, naturopathic medicine, but they're probably not going to disappear. <laughs> no, that would be really rare. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that that's really good to know because I... Fibroids is something that I don't really hear a lot about, but it's something that has affected me and it's affected women in my family. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, fr I'm of, of West Indian descent and my understanding as well is that uh, black women are at a higher risk for fibroids. And I am not a scientific study, but <laughs> from my own family and the, the high, high, high rates of it just within my own family, and so many of the women I know, I'm not sure what, what that's about, but it definitely impacts a lot of women. Yeah, it does. There's definitely a genetic component to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, kind of, I guess, switching gears again, uh, one of the topics that we talk about a lot on this podcast is cervical mucus and how important it is to keep the sperm along, um, alive long enough to fertilize the egg. And so kind of going and still chatting a little bit about, you know, infertility and different reasons why women struggle with their fertility. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, when women kind of present with abnormal cervical mucus and the impact it can have on fertility. Sure. Um, yeah, so cervical mucus, um, I mean, obviously is, is essential for the sperm you know, getting to where they need to go through the cervix. And um, often, uh, often women aren't, very, aren't aware of what their cervical mucus means or they're not watching it or paying attention. It's something I talk a lot about in my practice as well because uh, women aren't usually very well educated in terms of what their, their signs of fertility are. Things that I'm asking questions about are, you know, is there dryness during intercourse? Are they noticing, you know, much, you know, good, you know, clear, watery, slippery cervical mucus around ovulation? Um, and also, you know, is it is it very thick or sticky, which could indicate that there might be a, um, you know, a yeast infection or another imbalance as well? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the one of the benefits, I guess, of fertility awareness charting is gaining that understanding and knowledge about the way that your bodies work. Because I think that unless you're taught to look for it, you might notice it, but you might not. And I know that, or even if you do notice it, you don't really know what it is or why it's there, the mm -hmm. cervical mucus. So it's not really brought to your attention. So that's one of the things that, that, of course, we talk about a lot because of how important it is. Without cervical mucus, the sperm can't live long enough to fertilize the egg. And I know you had mentioned that it's one of those things that is not I think I, I was reading on on your blog in in the section about abnormal cervical mucus that it's not always one of the things that is checked out no I mean and some of that's just because when people go to a fertility clinic um, they usually check out the things that would impact a fertility treatment not what would impact your ability to conceive on your own 
So things like cervical mucus are often not discussed. Um, even progesterone levels are not discussed. Things that would be bypassed in a, in a fertility treatment are usually not really addressed, which I find interesting. <laughs> that is really interesting because you would think that if <laughs> you're trying to get a woman pregnant, <laughs> that you would look at those things that could that are imperative because cervical mucus, in order to get pregnant on your own without any type of intervention, you actually require it. I agree, but when you go to a clinic, they're usually looking at how they can help you get pregnant and do something to you to get you pregnant hmm. rather than um, how you can do it on your own. So I find that some of these things are definitely glossed over. So it's it's one of my big questions for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting to know. Um, well, when a woman does present with abnormal cervical mucus or perhaps if she doesn't have very much or if she doesn't have you know, any of the, you know, peak quality mucus, as you mentioned, clear and stretchy. What are some of the ways that you help women to work towards improving their, their mucus quality? Um, so again, the, the first thing is to try to figure out why. Um, so first thing to rule out is, is she taking antihistamine? So an antihistamine will dry mucus all over the body. And that's something that I see quite commonly. Mm -hmm. um, so women sometimes have more trouble conceiving during allergy season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's Which really cool. I've never of, heard of that before. <laughs> seems kind of obvious, but often really not addressed. So dehydration, another really obvious one. So making sure she's drinking enough fluids. Yeast infections. So many women have chronic low-grade vaginal yeast infections, and that makes the cervical mucus more thick. Um, yeast issues, I would say, are pretty much epidemic these days. You know, I hate to be another naturopath talking about candida, but I do. <laughs> and because, you know, we, we have a diet that feeds yeast amazingly well with, you know, too much white flour and sugar and everything. And, um, you know, most of us have been on way too many antibiotics as children um, or, you know, going on antibiotics for, for acne issues or other issues. Um, so most people do have some imbalance in terms of their overall body flora, and that can make a pretty profound effect on cervical mucus. Hmm. Um, another thing that I look at is food intolerances, um, because, you know, the mucus inside the fallopian tubes even. So in terms of, you know, the whole realm of fertility, I'm really big on addressing diet for all, all parts of, of fertility. And if that's not enough, then I will look at supplements. Um, but that's not the first on the list. So I don't jump right to the evening primrose oil or <laughs> <laughs> things like that, which may help. But, you know, for the most part, we're trying to address the underlying causes. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that you mentioned was um, that many women may have a low-grade chronic yeast infection. And when you mentioned that, I, I thought of a question and I was thinking, so is this something that they're not aware of or is this something that they are aware of generally? Um, I would say that a lot of women are sort of aware of it, meaning it's a mild annoyance that happens the week before their period. So mm. very many, very many women that I work with will tell me that they have a mild yeast flare up every month um, the week before they bleed. And what that looks like is some itching and irritation and maybe a little bit of, you know, thicker discharge. Not full blown like what we think of as a yeast infection with a whole lot of, you know, white cottage cheese like discharge and a lot of discomfort. And then it tends to go away when she bleeds, it gets flushed out again. But that, you know, chronic, you know, ebb and flow of yeast mm -hmm. <laughs> is affecting her cervical mucus the rest of the month as well. Well, one of the things that we talk about a lot on this on the podcast is kind of beyond using fertility awareness just to get pregnant or not get pregnant, the importance of using it, I guess, as a tool for your overall health. And yes. when you mentioned that, if a woman was charting her cycles and she had kind of chronic low-grade yeast infections, that would show up on her charts because instead of having her mucus dry up after she ovulates, for example, or having after she has her period having a few dry days, she may just have mucus some, you know, kind of like you said, like uh, thick, kind of sticky or whatever mucus, mm -hmm. but in times when she's technically, quote unquote, not supposed to have it. Right. So, so as you mentioned that, I just thought, oh, wow, if a woman's charting her cycles, then that's something she could probably jump on a little bit quicker and, and be more aware of. Oh, I love that idea because um, I always think of the menstrual cycle as being a vital sign. Like, you know, whatever's going on with your period is a huge indicator of your overall health. And um, it's, it's one thing that's so missing when somebody's on the pill. I can't tell, 
you know, how's their hormonal health doing? Um, because, you know, all we get is the pill cycle and not, not what her natural hormones are doing. Um, you know, when the period goes off, it's, it's just a marker of another imbalance in the body. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's so nice to hear you say that. And ironically, I did an interview with Colleen Flowers, and we actually talked a lot about the menstrual cycle as the fifth vital sign. And she talked about all the different ways that you, it, it, it kind of is a marker of, of your overall health. So it's really nice to hear that that idea is out there. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, because it's so important. And I mean, of course, the birth control pill plays an important role um, in so many women's lives, but it is important to know how important your your actual menstrual cycle is in sh just your overall health. And, and as you said, it can really pinpoint different hormonal imbalances, different issues. So. Mm -hmm. so one of the questions I wanted to ask you as well, one of the things that I noticed on, on your website was that women who, women who have been that, that kind of diagnosed with unexplained infertility, that's one of the areas that you're able to help with. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. You know, when do women end up with this diagnosis of unexplained infertility? So this diagnosis happens after a standard fertility workup. So by standard, I mean that they've had um, a test done to make sure that their fallopian tubes are open. They've had maybe one cycle monitored, uh, monitored at a fertility clinic, meaning they've gone in for regular blood work and ultrasounds to make sure that their hormones are on track and that they're ovulating. And then they've had the, you know, the, the, a semen analysis done as well. And that would be what I would consider a standard fertility workup. And if nothing is found there, um, it's considered unexplained. Now, I know that's not the most thorough workup, and there's a lot of other pieces missing, but it's something that approximately 30% of couples are diagnosed with. And it's probably the most frustrating diagnosis because you don't know whether you should you know, do IVF or whether you should keep trying on your own or what the issue is to fix. And I find that you know, it, it's, it's something that um, I can help a lot with because this is where my engineering brain comes into place, is <laughs> I like to go through my list of all the possibilities of what it could be and do appropriate testing based on somebody's health history. Um, I mean, this is so big for me right now that I'm actually putting together another website just on unexplained infertility um, because I really want to provide this information in, a, a, you know, in an accessible way to women or couples as well because it's a, uh, it's a huge issue and it's not rocket science. It's just, you know, it's like rule out the thyroid, check the progesterone levels. Um, you know, how's the cervical fluid? Um, are there any signs of endometriosis? Um, I even see, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome undiagnosed sometimes at this point. So there's a, you know, there's a bunch of factors that I'm looking for. Um, some of them, you know, clear diagnoses and some of them a little bit softer diagnoses, like, you know, like stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but when you actually have, you know, an answer and a direction to work in, number one, it makes my patients feel a lot better about things. And also, it, you know, it gives us a clear, a clear approach to, to how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, and since you men mentioned stress, at the beginning of the podcast, you mentioned that kind of the effect of stress on fertility is mm -hmm. one of the biggest reasons that women come to see you and kind of, you know, what you end up treating. And we talked a little bit about the impact that stress can have on fertility, but you know, when you notice those types of issues, what are some of the ways that you help w women to manage their stress uh, and to improve their fertility? Um, yeah, so in terms of how to manage the stress, that varies from person to person, but we have a, a long discussion about what it is that helps them to feel more relaxed. So it's really important to you know, include things in your life that um, that helps to counterbalance the day-to-day -day stresses. So that would be things like, you know, a yoga practice or meditation or prayer or, you know, just simply some downtime, some social time, whatever it is that, you know, that feeds that. I find that we're often really out of balance with the to-do lists and so many things on the go. Mm -hmm. um, the second is to try to take some of the stress out of the fertility itself because it becomes a huge vicious cycle when you know you're very stressed because you can't get pregnant and then the stress is affecting the fertility itself and you know again I, I can tell you so many stories of women who've gotten pregnant when they've stopped trying or uh, when they've gone on holidays <laughs> or when they've you know done their 
when they've done their last IVF treatment ever. <laughs> um, and then they magically conceive when they let go. It's, I think, one of the important learnings <laughs> that as women we need to, we need to, you know, get to is that, you know, sometimes worrying and thinking and planning doesn't make it all work out. And it's something that I know personally made a huge difference for, you know, my labors and deliveries as well, is that, you know, it's all about letting go. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so how, you know, how do I coach people on letting go and still actively trying to get pregnant? It's a fine balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we have to let go of charting the cycles for a while. And we have to just put a lot more of the play and the fun into it. Um, again, because I, I do think that, you know, fertility is a lot of, you know, science and, you know, and understanding, but there's also some magic in it too. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely aspects of it that we don't understand. Yes. Yeah, because I mean, you can chart your cycles and know exactly when you ovulate, you know exactly when you see cervical mucus. Why is it that in one cycle you don't conceive and in another cycle you do? Right. Especially when you know everything that's happening. So there's so much that we don't understand. Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is around kind of recurrent miscarriages, um, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously some women are getting pregnant and then just continuing, continually miscarrying. And so I wanted to kind of ask about what are some of the factors that can contribute to that? There's a lot. And that's actually a pretty complicated topic. <laughs> you know, the the one that we're always hoping for is that it's a thyroid issue. <laughs> Mm. So, you know, uh, even a low grade, you know, hypothyroid, underactive thyroid can cause recurrent miscarriage. So that's the first thing to rule out. And in some cases, it will be that simple. Um, the next would be um, to look at progesterone levels. Um, so sometimes a woman has, you know, just sufficient progesterone to get pregnant and to, you know, to get to the early phases of pregnancy, but loses it very early. So a, a, a low progesterone would cause a fairly early miscarriage, so before six weeks. After that, you know, blood clotting disorders are a huge one. So uh, often, you know, we go through a family history to see if anybody has had, you know, a stroke or blood clots at early ages. Sometimes we don't see it in the family history and a woman may still contain, ca carry an issue there. That would be genetic testing to find out if she carries an inherited blood clotting disorder. Sometimes it is egg quality. And, you know, then we'd sort of match up with her hormone levels and her age to see if that might be a possible explanation. One of the areas that I'm big on looking at is methylation defects. So it's something called MTHFR, which is how the body utilizes folate. And this is something that about 35% of the population carry. And it, you know, if a woman has a, a methylation issue, it can increase her risk of, of miscarriage as well as neural tube defects and Down syndrome as well. So that's another genetic test to check for that one. But the reason I like it so much is that the uh, the cure for it is simply taking the right forms of B vitamins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's something that we can actually modify by, um, you know, understanding the biochemistry of what's missing genetically. Mm -hmm. So those are a few, but there are cases where we don't find the answer. And, you know, in those cases, oh, autoimmune conditions, that's the other one. Um, so any type of an autoimmune condition can cause a recurrent miscarriage as well. So, uh, you know, as much as possible, we do testing up front to hopefully identify one or two of these factors. Often there's a couple and, you know, and try to address them. If the miscarriages continue to happen, um, you know, there are some, uh, some fertility specialists who, you know, whose practice focuses on, on, mis on recurrent miscarriage and they will do additional testing. And, you know, often those patients are put on a standard medical protocol that's pretty hard hitting. Like it's, uh, they're usually put on um, a steroid a good dose of progesterone and an injectable blood thinner. And then they, you know, see what happens. And surprisingly, that often works. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's not my first choice. But in cases where we can't find an underlying cause, it's sometimes worth a try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like if you're able to identify, you know, some of the factors, then at least you know what it is. And there's often mm -hmm. a lot you can do. Yes. And so that's, that definitely gives hope to women who have suffered from recurrent miscarriages because yes. that's heartbreaking oh, it's to hard. know that you're getting pregnant and to know that it's not sticking. Yeah, it's a really hard one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess one of, the, one of the topics that I did want to ask you about the ways that you do support women who are undergoing fertility treatments. So like intrauterine insemination, IUI, 
um, or in vitro IVF. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and, and maybe the role that acupuncture can play in that process as well. Sure. So, yeah, probably about a third of the patients that I'm working with with fertility are going through medical treatments at the same time. So what we're doing, um, you know, from a naturopathic point of view is um, trying to make them, you know, get them as optimally healthy as possible. Uh, so looking at, again, nutrition and inflammation and optimal diet and um, really looking at the stress levels because that's huge. And, um, you know, obviously being really careful that I'm not doing anything to interact with medications that they'll be put on. Um, acupuncture has actually been studied quite well, um, especially relative to IVF treatments. Um, ideally, if a, if, if a woman is doing acupuncture, I recommend that she start it you know, a month or two leading up to their leading up to the fertility treatments, um, because it can it can help with the hormone balance, the stress levels, um, really great with blood flow to the uterus and and supporting a strong uterine lining. Um, but the studies of acupuncture are done mostly with treatments that are um, immediately before and immediately after an IVF treatment. And in those cases, some of the studies have acupuncture showing that it can increase the success rate by as high as 65 percent. Wow. So it's something that I think is always a good idea to improve to include because it can't hurt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So what it does is, you know, there are some acupuncture points that are done that um, that um, help to regulate the hormones. They the big one is that it increases blood flow to the uterus um, and it also has a great effect on calming down the nervous system in terms of lowering the stress level. Um, and given that this is obviously an invasive and stressful procedure, anything that you can do there will help. I mean, if we just think about stress from the most basic level, when you're under an acute period of stress, there's very little blood flow to your abdomen and your pelvis. Um, you know, it's all going to your heart and your lungs and, you know, and all of the anxiety. So if we can calm down the nervous system and get the blood moving where it's supposed to go to, you know, be receptive to an embryo, it's going to help tremendously. Mm hmm. And I'm still chewing on the 65% statistic that you, <laughs> that you just know. That's huge. And yeah, um, because of course, IVF has a kind of limited success rate as it is. So yeah, it, um, it improves the yeah improves the success rate by up to 65%, which is pretty great. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's, that's, again, just giving it's so important, I think, for women to know their options because, I mean, mm -hmm. like you said, it can't hurt. So the yes. only thing it could possibly do is improve it, your your outcome. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's it's something that I've offered my patients, like you know, six o'clock acupuncture appointments on their IVF day, which is so inconvenient, but <laughs> so worth it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost always a Sunday morning. <laughs> of course, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> And, you know, when I'm there at 6.30 on a Sunday morning, it almost always works. <laughs> <laughs> so even more incentive to get up. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Now I have an associate who actually meets people at their clinic, so it's a little bit easier. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. Yeah. Well, I just have a, um, one or two questions that I like to close with. So for women who are listening to the podcast and maybe struggling with infertility, what advice, if any, would you give to them? The first advice I would give is to is to get some more opinions because I find that people often get very locked into a diagnosis that is, you know, difficult or, you know, are on the, the treadmill of fertility treatments without really understanding why and how they can support themselves better. Um, to take a step back and ask for help, you know, through a naturopath or um, an acupuncturist even uh, because there's so much we can do to support this journey and getting you you know, having a more active and proactive role in the fertility process will help tremendously as well. So that would be number one. And uh, number two is to to not forget how essential, you know, nutrition, exercise, and basic self-care are in the fertility journey, no matter where you are at in it. I see amazing things every day with just improving people's diets. And you know, a lot of the time I feel like I'm a common sense medicine doctor because a lot of what I tell people to do is, you know, drink water, have less caffeine, you know, keep their alcohol moderate, 
eat their vegetables. <laughs> um, but those things do make a phenomenal difference. And if we can get to a little bit more fine tuning in terms of identifying food intolerances or, you know, lowering inflammation, it's extremely powerful. Um, and the last thing is that there are often alternatives to medications in the you know natural supplement world. So it's not, not always necessary to take a you know, a fertility drug that, you know, that scares you with the side effects. There are a lot of things that you can try first before you start going down that road. Um, and most naturopaths are actually very reasonable in terms of timelines. We're not going to keep you, you know, just trying in the dark for, for a year before it's time to jump onto another path. But there are things to do first um, in terms of making your body as healthy as possible. Mm hmm. And what would you say is the most common myth or misconception about fertility that you would like to see corrected? Mm, that's a good one. It might be hard to pick one. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to pick one, but I'm going to start with age. I think that a lot of women have a lot of misconceptions about fertility in their 40s. And it's something that I really wish I could tell people sooner um, to not wait too late, too long to try to get pregnant. Yes, sometimes we can make it work, but sometimes it's just not possible. And I think with so many celebrities and, you know, and famous people having babies in their 40s, we don't really know what they did to have those babies. We don't know if they're their eggs. We don't know if they froze their eggs, what kind of treatments they had. And I would really advise women to try, you know, if at all possible, to try to have babies before 38. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, after that, it's a huge wild card. And I, you know, every day I have patients in my office who seem unaware of that and, you know, feel like, you know, that, that 41 isn't too late to try. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it might not be. And yes, we'll do everything possible to make that work. But it just makes me really sad that they've had a misconception through their 30s that, that you know, that will always work out. Mm -hmm. Well, you're echoing a sentiment. I did a, an interview with a woman named Dr. Melanie McDowell. Mm -hmm. And that is her area of specialty. So she's done a lot of research in, in the in the field of, of fertility at an advanced age and the effect of aging on, you know, your oocytes. And so we talked a lot about that in the podcast. And, mm -hmm. and it's something that I don't think I don't think women know to the extent that they need to. Yeah. And it's a hard one to address because you know, I get it. It's really hard to have a career taking off and to have babies at the same time. And that all happens in your 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I love about, I guess, naturopathic medicine and, and, and what you do, and especially when I was looking at the fertility care program that you developed and the preconception protocol, is that it seems like when women are having trouble conceiving, if they go to their doctor, their doctors tell them, well, if you're between this age and this age, then wait a year and come back. Right. <laughs> Keep trying. Good luck. Bye-bye. And then if they're, you know, if you're a little bit older, then fine, wait six months, but come back. But they're kind of, you know, just leave, do nothing different, <laughs> keep trying and mm -hmm. come back. But with your program, you talk about the, the, you know, the importance of preconception care. And also you don't have to wait to see you. And it would probably be better to see you before you're even trying. Yes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the program that you developed. Sure. So your preconception is really important. And the reason for that is that it takes, you know, a lot of days for an egg to be released, you know, up to three months, and it takes up to three months for, uh, you know, a healthy sperm to be formed. So what you're doing three months before you're trying is actually really important in terms of the outcome of your pregnancy. So having some time ahead of, you know, ahead of, you know, getting pregnant is, is important even for people who are not struggling with it. And what that means is, you know, again, the basics of healthy diet, um, you know, cutting down caffeine, um, cutting down or out the alcohol, um, possibly checking hormones if there's any signs of imbalance, definitely tracking and charting the cycles. Um, because you can learn so much before people are trying to conceive that way. And then in terms of, you know, other things that I like to do is some detox ahead of time because we pass on a lot of our toxic load to our first babies. And, um, you know, that's kind of heartbreaking to me mm -hmm. <laughs> is that, uh, you know, the toxins that we store in our fat cells get passed on. So whatever we can do to reduce the toxic load before getting pregnant is great. So I often put people on a, you know, some kind of a detox program and get them doing saunas as much as possible in the year before they're trying to get pregnant. 
Mm -hmm. In terms of the program itself, um, you know, it, it's very individual. So I don't have a, you know, a set schedule for appointments and, you know, what, what I'm going to address. It's really based on going through, um, you know, somebody's health history very thoroughly. Um, and I, you know, I get told every day that nobody's ever asked me the, all those questions before. <laughs> so I, I get into a lot of details in terms of personal and family history and timelines. And, you know, again, I really like to know and understand my patients well. Mm -hmm. Well, how can our listeners get in touch with you or make an appointment to see you if they happen to live in the Toronto area? Sure. Um, so uh, all of my information is on my website. So that website is drshawnadaru.com. So D-R-S-H-A-W-N-A-D-A-R-O-U.com. On the website, you can book an appointment directly. I have online scheduling and I also have a, an associate and uh, who's a naturopath as well. And we are growing the clinic this year. So soon there'll be more info on that website in terms of other practitioners and support as well. I also have a, a, a new website that will be launching um, hopefully in March. And that, uh, that's um, unexplainedinfertilityinfo.com. And that's uh, all of the information about the unexplained, um, the unexplained diagnosis and I'm working on a, a really great free download on that site of how to how to identify what what the cause might be of your unexplained un infertility. Mm, that sounds just fantastic. I'm sure that's going to help thousands of women mm -hmm. who've been diagnosed with unexplained fertility because, as you mentioned, that would be the most frustrating diagnosis ever. Mm -hmm. It's basically like saying, "We don't know. Good luck." <laughs> Yeah, or we don't know, and here's an expensive fertility treatment that might help. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. <Not good. laughs> well, you know, Shauna, I'd like to thank you so much for being um, with me today and being so generous with your time and sharing your knowledge and experience with the audience. I very much enjoyed our conversation, and I just feel like it's jam-packed with so much important information, and so I can't wait to share it with the listeners. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm all about getting the word out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, I would love it if you shared it with a friend and helped to spread the word. If you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, just search for Fertility Friday on iTunes or Stitcher and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. There's some amazing guests coming up. I say that every episode, but there really are some amazing episodes coming up and you definitely won't want to miss them. And of course, if you're loving the show, please leave an honest review on iTunes. And of course, a five-star review would be awesome. Uh, but this will just help more people to find the show. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. You can stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash Shauna and you can also find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook page so that's facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays with an S and as always be well and happy charting